Today I present to you another episode of When Nature Unearths the Dead. It's been well over a year since I made one and there has been a fair amount of requests for it. If you're unfamiliar with the series, this is where I take a look at several examples of when the forces of nature have forced the dead from their intentional or unintentional places of rest. Be they recently missing persons, or the long dead and buried, Mother Nature has brought them to the surface in one way or another. The Great Flood of 1913 occurred between March 23rd and March 26th. After four days of heavy rain in central and eastern United States, several major rivers burst their banks. The damage caused was widespread, affecting 11 states in all. More than a quarter of a million people were left homeless, but the final death toll is not certain. In Indiana and Ohio, which were by far the worst affected states, it is estimated that between 500 and 700 people lost their lives. Waters rose to as high as 18 feet in some parts of Ohio. When the Whitewater River burst its banks in Indiana, one of the worst affected communities was the town of Laurel, Franklin County, which is 50 miles southeast of Indianapolis. To the south of the town lived a man named Frank Lockwood, who owned a large farm. Most of the Lockwood farm was completely washed out and layers of earth shifted in the torrent. When the waters receded in the coming days, the true extent of the damage was revealed. By mid-April, the terrain on the Lockwood farm was firm enough to walk on. Frank Lockwood and a teacher named Jesse Ailes from Richland Township, Rush County, were the first to investigate the affected area. While sifting through the sodden earth, the men found a complete human skeleton. As they ventured further out, two more skeletons were unearthed, along with hundreds of other scattered bones and pottery. Local man, Squire Thomas Hellman, believed that the remains belonged to Native Americans and suggested that the Lockwood Farm was the site of a former Indian burial ground. According to the newspaper, the Rushville Daily Republican dated April the 14th, Hellman came to this conclusion because of the shape of the skulls and the craftsmanship of the pottery. The area searched covered three quarters of a square mile and attracted many of Laurel's men and boys to take part in the effort. The bones were not officially dated in the sources I read, only being described as from scores of years ago. The skeletons in Laurel were not the only years-old human remains to be exposed by the Great Flood, however. Five weeks later, on May the 19th, two brothers, William and Dr. Charles Kane, while walking around their farm south of Connorsville, Fayette County, found what they described as a much contorted skeleton. At first, only the skull protruded from the eroded earth. When they dug it out, they found it to be sat upright, with the left arm thrown over the right shoulder. The Kane brothers' story was featured in the Lake County Times, who confidently confirmed it to be the skeleton of an Indian squaw. I tried to contact the Indiana Historical Society to try to find out what became of the 1913 human remains. As of the time of recording, which is the 25th of July 2022, I have not had a reply. Known as Jesse James Hughes or the Outlaw, boxer James Melvin Hughes of Mobile, Alabama, turned professional in 1987. After some success in the sport, his career was cut short in 1990, when he was arrested for robbing what turned out to be a drug dealer at Knife Point. When he married his fiancée Carmen in 1993, he was fresh out of the Fountain Correctional Facility in Atmore. This is something that helped fuel his outlaw persona. The still promising welterweight was determined to go straight and succeed in boxing, and he did. He went on to win the United States Boxing Association title in 1994 when he beat Anthony Stevens of Louisiana. On July 7, 1995, he knocked out Nick Ruper of Ontario. The fight, which was televised on ESPN, 
was meant to be a step closer to a world championship fight. What was meant to be a time for celebration and a hero's welcome back in Alabama turned to tragedy. Little more than two weeks later, on July 24th, Hughes arrived at his wife's tanning salon to do some painting. After this, he went to the boxing gym. He only stayed for a short while before saying he'd had enough. On leaving, Hughes was seen arguing with his manager, Jerry Tillman, outside the gym before driving off in his truck. Exactly what happened next is not known, but his manager, Tillman, said that he followed James in his car because he was worried he would meet up with a drug dealer. Jerry Tillman said he followed the boxer to his apartment and watched him enter. He said he came out a short while later having changed his clothes. According to Tillman, he continued to follow James, but eventually lost him at a red light. The next day, July 25th, James Hughes was seen withdrawing $100 from an ATM at 9am. Three hours later, his truck was found parked on the CSX train tracks in Mobile. There were no keys inside and no sign of James Hughes. There was, however, a clean hatchet found nearby that had been removed from the truck and used in an attempt to cut the vehicle free from the tracks. In early August of 1995, the tropical cyclone known as Hurricane Erin swept through southern Alabama and the swamplands next to the CSX train tracks were churned up and disturbed. This resulted in James Hughes' bloated body floating to the surface. It was Saturday, August 5th when James Hughes' body was recovered, 11 days since he was last seen alive and his truck was pulled from the railway tracks. James's father, Jerry Hughes, was the one who identified him, the only recognisable feature being his now famous tattoos, an Old West style six shooter and a skull on his bicep. An autopsy report stated that he had trace amounts of cocaine in his liver, but this was not enough to kill him. The only possible attack wounds were a slight bruise on the side of his head and a small abrasion on his throat. His keys, wallet and watch were never found. Hughes was thought to have been murdered, any suspicion of suicide was dismissed by his father, who said he loved his wife and son too much to leave them behind. Some say it was a drug dealer whom he owed money to. Others refer to an alleged money dispute Hughes had with his manager Jerry Tillman, suggesting that he was involved, especially when you consider that the sheriff overlooking the investigation was Jack Tillman, the brother of James Hughes' manager Jerry, and a former boxer himself. Another thing that raised some suspicion was Jerry Tillman's comments about following James to his apartment. Newspaper reports mentioned that James did not return home as Tillman had said. He had actually visited two bars. It appears that he hadn't changed his clothes either, something that Tillman claimed after following James to his apartment. According to the Hughes family, when James's body was recovered from the swamp, he was wearing the same clothes he'd worn to the gym the day he went missing. For years, the Hughes family, believing that James had been murdered, sought justice. Sadly, James's mother passed away in 2016 without finding out the truth behind her son's passing. Here is James's father speaking in 2017. She was definitely hoping that it would happen before she left this earth because she wanted to see the people that killed her baby boy punished for the deed that they'd done. Until this day, the death of 29-year-old James Melvin Hughes, a.k.a. Jesse James Hughes, a.k.a. The Outlaw, remains a mystery. If you're a regular on YouTube and watch other channels like mine, you're probably familiar with the story of Gabrielle or Gabby Petito. The 22-year-old's harrowing story was heavily reported on in September and October of 2021. In June of last year, Gabby began a social media journey based on the travels of herself and her boyfriend Brian Laundrie. Her YouTube channel Nomadic Static and Instagram accounts were the main focus and platform to share their journey. The childhood sweethearts who met on Long Island, New York, embarked on a cross-country trip, heading northwest from their Northport home in Florida. Taking Petito's 2012 White Ford Transit van, the plan was to visit the national parks of the West Coast. On August the 12th, police in Moab, Utah, received a call from someone who had witnessed an altercation between Gabby and Brian at the side of the road. 
they reported that the young woman had struck the man and described a white transit van with a Florida number plate. Gabby and Brian were stopped and approached by the Moab Police Department close to the Arches National Park in Utah, a meeting that was caught on police body cameras. No domestic charges were filed, but the pair were separated for the night. On August 17th, Brian flew back to Florida from Salt Lake City. According to his family, this was to empty a storage unit he and Gabby had been hiring and to close the account to save money. He rejoined Gabby in Salt Lake City on August the 23rd. Four days later, the couple were seen arguing again, this time in Jackson, Wyoming, at the Merry Piglet's Tex-Mex restaurant. As would be expected, Gabby kept in regular contact with her parents throughout the trip. This contact, however, stopped abruptly on August the 30th. The last message they received from her number read, No service in Yosemite. Apart from the message being uncharacteristically abrupt for Gabby, her parents had reason to believe she was at the Grand Teton National Park at the time, not Yosemite, which was more than 900 miles away in California. It's known that Brian returned home to Florida on September the 1st. He spent the next few days with his parents, Christopher and Roberta. They were camping in Fort DeSoto from September the 6th until September the 8th. On September the 11th, 2021, Gabby's family, who still lived in New York, reported her missing. When Northport authorities visited the Laundry family home that evening, they were simply given the information of their attorney and told to contact him. The Petito family tried to contact the Laundries for help directly, but they received no response. Then, after several days, police eventually get a call asking them to attend the Laundry family home, because Christopher and Roberta Laundry hadn't seen their son since September the 13th, when he left their home and headed to the Carlton Nature Reserve in Florida, 12 miles northwest of their home. Meanwhile, the search for Gabby continued 2,000 miles away in Wyoming, and on September the 19th, human remains were found in an undeveloped camping area on the eastern boundary of Wyoming's Grand Teton National Park. Two days later, a coroner confirmed that the remains belonged to Gabby, and concluded she died of blunt force injuries to the head and neck and strangulation. Her body had been out in the wilderness for three to four weeks. With the absconding Brian Laundry now a murder suspect, his parents were interviewed by the FBI at their home. Suspicion hung heavily over Christopher and Roberta Laundry. There was a belief that they were intentionally steering police in the wrong direction and hiding their son. On September the 23rd, the US District Court of Wyoming issued an arrest warrant for Brian for the illegal use of Gabby's credit card between August 30th and September 1st, during which time he had spent more than $1,000. The search for Brian in Florida had yielded no clues, so in October of 2021, the search area of the 24,000-acre Colton Reserve was extended and efforts stepped up. Next to the Colton Reserve is the Mayakahachi Creek Park, this is where a Ford Mustang Brian had been driving was found. The area that the remains were found, we're told the area where the remains were found had, had been wet and had since dried out, dry weather, as you pointed out, JB, um, very much helped reveal these human remains and we don't know how long the remain how long that particular body has been dead and we don't know exactly who the body is but we do know it was found near a backpack that has been identified as something that would uh, be consistent with something Brian Laundry would have had there have been questions for for weeks now who was going to be the person to provide the information or provide assistance, provide the break that this case needed to find Brian Laundry. All along, the, the one who was able to provide perhaps the biggest break in this case is Mother Nature. <laughs> Just by allowing these waters to recede and recede to a level that these, that these, this, these new items have been discovered and now we have the report that partial human remains have been discovered, but Mother Nature not dumping water here over the course of, of October. And yes, there's been there's been precipitation, but not anywhere close to what we saw in September. No. October has been in large part a very dry month here in the no. Tampa Bay area, very lar uh, large in part a, a dry month for Sarasota County. And Mother Nature 
not dumping all of this water, allowing all of that swampy wetland water to recede, now we have these developments here today. The remains found on Wednesday, October 20th at the Carlton Reserve, in an area which had previously been underwater, were that of Brian Laundry. As previously stated, the lack of rain throughout much of October had led to the exposure of his corpse. By the time the search party had arrived at his location, much of his body had been pulled apart by scavengers. Had the weather not been so uncharacteristic, it's possible that Brian Laundry, who was identified through dental records, may never have been found. It was revealed that Brian had shot himself in the head. The revolver was found close to his body. Authorities also found a drenched notebook which was salvaged along with a backpack. The FBI said in January of 2022 that the notebook had a written confession from Brian Laundrie stating that he had killed Gabby. When Brian and Gabby's respective phone records were checked, there were messages sent between them after she had disappeared. As Brian had had access to Gabby's phone, it's believed that he fabricated these conversations to make it appear to authorities that she was still alive. Twenty-seven-year-old Rudy Moder of Augsburg, Germany, was a dedicated mountaineer and cross-country skier, a skill he had learnt whilst in the German army. Moder took this skill to the Rocky Mountains, moving to Fort Collins, Colorado in 1983. On February the 13th, 1983, he left the Zimmerman Lake Trailhead to the northwest of the Rocky Mountain National Park for what would be a planned five-day solo trip. His intention was to cross Thunder Pass and the infamous Never Summer Mountains, a mountain range known for blocking out even the mildest of seasons. When Moda failed to meet his roommate Hans as they had arranged, he was reported missing on February the 19th. A search operation began that day, and despite the effort being hampered by heavy snowfall, some of Moda's personal items were found. A food cache, ski poles and a sleeping bag were found inside a snow cave at the mouth of Box Canyon, where it's believed Moda spent at least one night. Even though the search had been narrowed down to a relatively small area, and included 65 personnel, avalanche dogs and four helicopters, it was called off after four days. Efforts continued into the following spring and summer, but alas, there was still no sign of Rudy himself. In 1995, Rocky Mountain National Park Ranger Jim Richardson thought for a moment that he had found Moda's body in the park's rugged northwest border. What he thought was Moda lying amongst large boulders was just a oddly coloured rock formation. As the years passed by, there was speculation that Rudy may have wanted to disappear, possibly to start a new life and effectively faking his own death. Then in August of 2020, a hiker traversing the aptly named Skeleton Gulch at 11,000 feet saw what he recognised as avalanche debris. In amongst the fallen trees and rocks, he found human skeletal remains. It was an exciting time for park rangers, and with the assistance of the FBI evidence recovery team, a new investigation began. But the initial operation was short-lived, as all resources and manpower were redeployed to tackle the approaching Cameron Peaks fires to the northwest, which were beginning to threaten the west side of the park. It wasn't until 2021 that search efforts returned to Skeleton Gulch, where more ski equipment was found, along with remains of personal items believed to belong to Moda. Don Davis, who was part of the original search effort in 1983, spoke of his memories. We found his pack in his snow cave because they dug around and his sleeping bag and stuff was in there, so we knew he stayed there at least one night. But there was fresh snow several feet deep. When Davis looked up, he saw trouble. The avalanche hazard, there were so many of them, it was dangerous for team members. After four days, they gave up. In the summers, they'd hike and look. We'd say his skis have to be there somewhere. They don't deteriorate from what they're made out of. Finally, last year, a hiker found remains. We searched Skeleton Gulch. Now remember, it's a huge area. A big place, wide open and peaceful. He died doing what he liked to do. It feels good to have closure, because this was 
always a mystery. After the Grand County Coroner's Office failed to officially identify Rudy through his dental records, the results being inconclusive, a forensic coroner in Germany worked to positively identify him. In the wake of a mystery that endured for 38 years, park officials are working with the German government to repatriate Moda's remains. In 2021, Rudy Moda's sister, Alfreda, was informed by her son during a hospital stay for a knee operation that he had received word from Colorado that his uncle Rudy had likely been found. Alfreda said that despite the remains not yet being confirmed at the time, she immediately began to arrange her brother's funeral, even obtaining a burial plot. But as of January of 2022, which is as far as my research goes, there still hadn't been a funeral. Spokesperson for the Rocky Mountain National Park, Carl Patterson, said, We are assuming he was caught in an avalanche. His remains were scattered within the slide path. It does not appear that there have been more avalanches in the same slide path, based on the tree size and growth. This next story was brought to my attention by fellow YouTuber Sean McNeeny when he mentioned it briefly in a video called Weird and Gruesome Objects Found on the Lincolnshire Coast. The story piqued my interest, so I attempted to find out more. Cleethorpes Beach on England's east coast lies on the estuary of the River Humber in the county of Lincolnshire. It was here on Wednesday the 11th of August 2010 that a member of the public found a human foot washed up on the shore. It was found to be the right foot of a man named Jason Morley, a 28-year-old university graduate from Sheffield. Jason was last seen by his girlfriend in December of 2008, when she left home to go to work. His car was later found abandoned at the Humber Bridge, 20 miles northwest of where his foot was found. A month later, on Saturday the 11th of September, Jason's left foot was found 200 miles away, by a tourist on the island of Tuschelling off the northern coast of the Netherlands. Both feet were still inside the trainers Jason wore and were matched to him through DNA testing. Jason Morley, who worked in IT after graduating from Sheffield Hallam University with a degree in electrical engineering, was reported missing by his family in Lincolnshire, three months after he moved to Monk Breton in Barnsley to live with his girlfriend. Just days before his disappearance in 2008, Jason had spent the Christmas period with his family in Lincolnshire before driving back to the home he shared with his girlfriend. On Saturday the 4th of September 2010, just one week before the discovery of Jason's left foot in the Netherlands, a cyclist named Steve Payne and his daughter were at the Chowder Ness foreshore of the south bank of the River Humber when they found a man's foot a short distance from the bridge where Jason's car was abandoned in 2008. Steve Payne described what they saw. There was a swan in the water along the water's edge. While my daughter was taking a photograph of the swan, I noticed there was a man's tan leather boot with a sock hanging from it. I had a look at it and realised there was a human foot inside. It was initially thought that this foot may have belonged to a student from Hull named Russell Bowling, who had gone missing in March of 2010. However, it was eventually identified as belonging to a man from Lincolnshire who hadn't been seen since February of 2010. Sadly, there have been no more leads in relation to the men's fate and the mystery surrounding Jason Morley, the missing man from Lincolnshire and Russell Bowling, remains unsolved. Humberside Police said that the fate of the men were not linked, adding that the 2010 discoveries were simply coincidental.